Welcome everybody to the 2021 POVI lecture. I'm Karen Kirkham, the chair of the JCT. Uh, the JCT set up the POVI lectures in memory of the late Philip J. POVI, their much loved former joint secretary, who served the JCT and to a significant extent actually drafted the text of the JCT contracts for 50 years, starting in 1951. To many of us, Philip was in a very real sense, Mr. JCT. Having worked alongside Philip at the Construction Confederation, I also had the privilege of attending the inaugural POVI lecture in 2003. On that occasion, my predecessor as JCT chair, Richard Saxon, then REBA vice president and a director of BDP, spoke eloquently on the topic of a vision for the industry, formerly known as construction. It's not all about contracts. POVI lectures over the years have ranged across many industry hot topics including data and digitisation, value-driven procurement, collaboration, and the export of UK contract culture to other countries and jurisdictions. This year, we perhaps inevitably remain in the virtual space. Whilst this sadly cuts down networking opportunities, it's one upside of the pandemic, which has otherwise narrowed our other horizons, that last year's POVI webinar was the best attended ever with 400 registered delegates. Today we have another high profile speaker. Keith Waller, the programme director of the Construction and Innovation Hub is going to talk to us about how value based decisions can drive construction's transformation. Value is one of the four core themes of the Construction and Innovation Hub's transformation programme, whose mission statement is to create better outcomes for the current and future generations by driving the adoption of manufacturing and digital approaches that improve the delivery, resilience and performance of infrastructure. Keith will explore how value-based decisions targeting whole life performance and a focus on public sector investment can result in more successful outcomes for projects that all too often don't realise their intended value despite being delivered on time and on budget. Just quickly to mention to you, you should check out the Construction Innovations Hub's marvellous website, which is probably one of the most original and actually fun to use that I've ever seen. Keith's own background is civil engineering and he's been involved in construction and infrastructure projects for over 30 years, leading many major projects in the UK and internationally. In 2010, he was seconded to, go to government with Infrastructure UK, the predecessor to the Infrastructure and Projects Authority. A keen advocate of driving innovative and productive solutions, his work in government led to the publication of the UK's first National Infrastructure Plan, Infrastructure and Carbon Review, the development of the Infrastructure Cost Review and IPA's Transforming Infrastructure Performance Programme, published in 2017. Keith is also a member of the Construction Leadership Council, where he chairs the Manufacturing and Performance Workstream. Keith, welcome. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to start by offering my thanks to JCT for affording me the honour of delivering this year's POVI lecture. When I look back at those who have spoken in previous years, I recognise so many distinguished figures from our industry who have shared this honour, so thank you. My theme this year is centred on the concept of value and specifically how value-based decisions can support the transformation of our sector. There's quite a lot to unpick there, so I'd like to break this down into three main chunks. Firstly, what do we mean by value? Secondly, what is the transformation we should be seeking? And thirdly, what might this mean for professionals working in our sector and how JCT might indeed support and perhaps enable this transformation. And I will try to do this without any reference to Peppa Pig and make no attempt to impersonate a car's engine. To do so would be grossly unprofessional and disrespecting of the audience. But before I begin, just building on what Karen said, I'm conscious that not many of you will know my background nor indeed my current role. So as Karen said, I'm a civil engineer by profession and have spent over 30 years working in construction 
and infrastructure projects in the UK and overseas. But perhaps the most unexpected and interesting part of my career was when back in 2010, uh, I was seconded into Her Majesty's Treasury to work on infrastructure policy, strategy and delivery. I never had any ambition to be a civil servant, nor any real understanding of what this would mean. It seemed so far removed from my normal day job in business and on projects. And besides, they only asked me to come in for two or three days a week for five or six weeks, so it's only ever going to be a short-term posting in Whitehall. But I ended up there for nine years and full-time. And despite my initial reticence, it was the most interesting time of my professional career. I was lucky that timing coincided with the ramp up in political and policy importance of infrastructure. When I joined, there had been no national infrastructure plan. No construction pipeline had been published. The National Infrastructure Commission had not been established. There was no central strategy, no clearly articulated plan. And yet infrastructure is so vital to the economic, social and environmental well-being of our nation. So on entering this unexpected world, I sought some counsel from other people who had been who had experience of both public and private sectors. And one of the best bits of advice I got in those early days, and it stuck with me the whole time I was in government, was working out what to do is the easy part. Working out how to get it done is where the real skill lies. What easy, how hard. And it would be very easy for someone from the private sector to get frustrated if they expected government to work exactly the same way as their businesses did. It doesn't, and nor should it. That doesn't mean that government and business don't, don't share the same ambition. It's just the process and the path are different, more complex, and they need to be. And that's why so many good ideas can wither because all of the effort has gone into what and not enough effort has gone into how. How can it be delivered, not just what the idea is. And in the same way, it would be good for government officials to understand how business works and what businesses' needs are, it's equally important for businesses to understand how policy is made, how decisions are taken in Whitehall, and how the symbiotic partnership between the public and private sectors can be strengthened. So my surprise uh, secondment into government led to me being asked lots of questions from my former private sector colleagues. I was often asked, what is it like working with government ministers? Do they have a long-term strategic vision or are they just obsessed with the headlines in tomorrow's Daily Mail? And I would reply, it depends. Some of them have a long-term strategic vision stretching five, 10, sometimes 15 days into the future. The rest are quite short term. But in reality, government, like business, needs to get the right blend of long and short term thinking for it to be effective. Too long term without any short term delivery means that governments are unlikely to get re-elected. Too long term, um, too short term without any long term direction means that things won't really change. So getting that balance right of something that fits the political narrative and meets those social, economic and environmental needs is really quite difficult to achieve. And of course, priorities change, just as governments change as well. When I started in 2010, we were in the grip of the financial crisis. Then the focus of government and departments was on capital efficiency. How could they save money? But by the time I left at the end of 2018, the focus had become much more long-term, much more strategic. 
it was less about delivering cheaper construction and more about delivering improved whole life performance. Essentially, there was a gradual change of priority between uh, cost towards value in its broadest sense, which is the theme I'd like to explore today. So I said I'd cover it in three main chunks. What do we mean by value? What is the transformation we should be seeking? And what could this mean for professionals working in our sector? So I'll start with what do we mean by value? And I'd like to start with an assertion, which is whilst cost will never die, value will become king. Whilst cost will never die, value will become king. And we all know that finances are constrained at the moment, both in the public and the private sector. And as a nation, we spend around 65 billion pounds every single year just on our economic and social infrastructure. Not houses, not commercial, not retail, just on our social and economic infrastructure, 65 billion pounds every single year. New schools, new hospitals, transport and utility networks, and much more. And with such a huge level of investment, the question we should be asking is not how cheap can I buy it and how much risk can I transfer to the supply chain? We should be asking how can we lever this investment to deliver the greatest social, economic and environmental value? And this of course means looking beyond the project, looking beyond that capital phase of delivery and consider not just what it is, but what it enables. How does it support productive growth in our economy? How does it enhance biodiversity and deliver greater social value? How does it support a path being driven towards net zero and so on? So we must, not, we must consider not only what it is, but how it, how it was created and how it is operated. And if we're to do that and deliver those better social, economic and environmental outcomes from our huge investment in the built environment, we need to look beyond cost as our ambition and certainly look far beyond cheapness as our ultimate end goal. That doesn't mean we should ignore cost. Capital cost and affordability are still and will always be a very important part of the value equation, but they are not the only part. One of the last documents I wrote when I was in government was Transforming Infrastructure Performance, or TIP. And a few weeks ago, the IPA published uh, an update to it, the TIP Roadmap to 2030. And I'd encourage you to have a read through that if you've not done so already. But if you look back at the original TIP document, you'll see a reference to something called a SNAP model, SNAP. The SNAP model sets out a series of object objectives and measures that can drive improved performance of a system, a network, an asset, and a project. SNAP, System, Network, Asset, Project. And in the past, too often, we have made decisions just at the project level. How much does it cost? How long is it gonna take? The, the safety, the quality, the cost remain important, but they are not the only arbiters of value. Just considering these project aspects, the capital phase will not maximise the value opportunities and the benefits that can be delivered from the investment we make. We need to consider how that asset performs in service. Is it delivering the benefits to the, to the user, uh, to the owner, to the operator? This could include, for example, the availability of the asset or the energy performance in service. In service performance is an important part of that value equation. At a network level, we need to think about, for example, does an individual, a new highway scheme, support the ambitions to improve capacity across the strategic road network? How one asset can influence a wider network could, could tip the balance between two different options if we're thinking beyond the project and thinking at a network level as well. But if we really want to consider value in the broadest sense. We also need to think at a higher level again, at a system level. Infrastructure and the built environment are nothing 
if not a system of systems. Which means that if we are thinking at a system level, we must also consider not just those direct benefits of the project or the asset and what they bring directly, but some of those indirect consequential benefits that that investment may unlock, how it can support those wider social, economic and environmental objectives that we seek as a nation. So if we want to consider those things and bring them into our decision making process, we need to think about value not simply through the lens of the capital cost of a project, but through the value it delivers at a project, an asset, a network and a system level. And transforming infrastructure performance alongside uh, the SNAP model also set out some of its, uh, some of government's ambitions for how to procure for growth. We, we heard from one of the earlier POVI lectures, procuring for value being a key part of that conversation. It also points to how we can in advance and use innovation, digital and manufacturing techniques to drive improved performance. And I'll come on to later how, how we deliver projects, how that can also start to deliver value uh, beyond the project itself. And it wasn't just government saying we needed a better way. At the same time as TIP was published, the Construction Leadership Council, through Anne Bentley, uh, were, were producing their Procuring for Value paper. So we had both a push and a pull, pointing to the need to think beyond initial capital cost and consider whole life value in our decision making. So if we accept that assertion, how do we do it? At the end of 2018, I finished my secondment into government. Earlier that year, the government had announced the construction sector deal as part of its industrial strategy, setting out ambitions for improved whole life value, for faster construction delivery, for lower carbon emissions, for a better trade in our sector. The sector deal is the first centrally coordinated and the largest funded R&D programme in our sector with government investing £170 million over four years to support the sector's transformation. Now, whilst £170 million may seem like a small number compared to the size of our sector, and certainly it's smaller in value than the support regularly given to other sectors of our economy, like aerospace and auto, that £170 million represents exactly £170 million more than government has ever invested before. So it is a start, a welcome start. And if we can demonstrate we are delivering transformation, we're spending that money wisely, it could lock, unlock opportunities for further investment from government to help drive the transformation we need. It's an important first step on our transformation journey. Now from that £170 million that government has invested, around £75 million was given to the Construction Innovation Hub, which is a partnership between the Manufacturing Technology Centre, uh, the Building Research Establishment, BRE, and the Cambridge University Centre for Digital Built Britain. So it seemed a natural step for me to move from developing the policy uh, and the strategy that government was putting forward for construction and infrastructure to move out to deliver it in industry. So my job now is running that Construction Innovation Hub programme and what we are doing to support transformation over our four-year programme. And a key element of our programme is centred on value. And it's worth emphasising that the Construction Innovation Hub itself is not, nor will it ever be, a market player. Our job is not to crowd out uh, suppliers in the marketplace. Our job is to be a market enabler. We don't want to be another consultant or another contractor or another provider. We want to unlock opportunities for businesses to get that transformation through and start to transform their businesses and the outcomes that they themselves are delivering. We want our program to help government and clients make better decisions. Better decisions that support the transformation of the sector and the better outcomes from the investment 
that we are making. And we want, our, we want to use our funding, and we are using our funding, to develop new tools, products, processes that can be used by industry to help accelerate their journey on transformation. So we have been successful in, as a market enabler because we're not trying to replace or compete with anyone. We can be seen by governments and clients as a vehicle to help them deliver their policy ambitions and develop things that support some of their ambitions around productivity or levelling up. And we're seen by industry as you know, using our money to help develop tools and products that will help them deliver for their clients and support their own businesses to innovate and to grow. So it's in this spirit of collaborative endeavour with government and industry that the Construction Innovation Hub, alongside around 600 individuals from across disciplines and sectors, professional bodies, client organisations, public sector, private sector, came together to develop the Value Toolkit, which sets out to try to define value through the lens of value drivers for a given project or programme. And I've only got one slide today, which is this. So we want the Value Toolkit to be used to drive that better decision making that supports the delivery of those better social, economic and environmental outcomes and using value based decision making to achieve this. This means better outcomes from what we deliver and how we deliver it, leading to a more sustainable built environment and a more sustainable business model for industry. The Value Toolkit provides clients and industry with a more consistent approach to communicating, measuring and realising value within their projects, their programmes and across their investment portfolios. So this slide shows one of the key outputs of the Value Toolkit, which is really a value profile. And you see we've created this value profile uh, from a weighted set of value drivers from a four capitals model. The four capitals, we have produced capital, which includes the important elements of life cycle cost, natural capital, which includes climate impacts and biodiversity, for example, social capital, which includes measures of equality and diversity, and human capital, picking up things like skills and employment. And we recognise that the relative importance of these, these value drivers, will vary between projects and regions and clients. So profiles, the shape, the value profile shape you can see there will look different depending on the circumstances, depending on the client. But I am keen to see that these value drivers are clearly articulated to the market by clients and widely understood by industry. And crucially, being used to inform decisions that are taken not just in the capital phase of projects, but throughout the investment life cycle, from the business case through to operation. And of course we know that clients now are operating in an increasingly complex decision-making environment. For public sector clients, there is a need to demonstrate that policy is being translated into meaningful action in its projects and programmes. For the private sector, the, the increasing role of ESGs is driving the need to demonstrate the delivery of broader outcomes beyond traditional cost, time and quality. So value-based decisions are essential to meet these outcomes. Is the choice I'm making value enhancing or value destroying? Which option presents the best chance of delivering the value I seek? Which supplier is more likely to give me the value I seek? The Value Toolkit helps clients and their advisors to measure and quantify the impact of these choices. But there are wider benefits to this approach, even more so. Let us consider for a moment the public sector and its large pipeline of projects and programmes across construction and infrastructure. Set out, much of it in, in IPA's recently published £650 billion national infrastructure and construction pipeline. Now, all our government departments are operating under the same strategic policy landscape. You would think, therefore, that the value profile, the shape behind me, would not vary dramatically between different departments. They share the same policy ambitions on social value, on net zero, on biodiversity. 
And I would hope this would lead to a similar shape to the profile. Now, there will be differences reflecting the particular drivers of a project or the needs of a particular region, but the fundamental shape should be recognisable to the market. And of course, if it is, that starts to give the market some signals uh, and confidence and clarity that the key value drivers of the largest clients in the construction sector in the UK, uh, they know what's important to them. And they can start to invest in developing uh, their solutions, their skills, their technology, their products to respond to something that can be deployed not just on one project, but across a large estate. For too long, we've seen clients with very similar projects set out their commercial strategies and procurement approaches in wildly different ways. It's almost as if custom and practice rather than real need were driving those decisions. For business, this has made it difficult to differentiate on anything other than cost and not always then allowed them to innovate or deliver better whole life solutions sometimes not even to have them considered in any assessment process. And it's been a long held ambition of mine for industry to be able to develop uh, the capability to invest strategically for the market, not just tactically for each project. The full suite of tools in the value toolkit go beyond just value def definition. We can talk about risk, the client approach to its delivery model, its commercial strategy, how it makes appointments, how it does measurement and evaluation. But actually value is driven and measured and assessed and considered at all stages of the investment life cycle. So I would like to see uh, the value toolkit and the principles therein being used more widely, not just in the public sector. And it is specifically re referenced in, in documents like the TIP roadmap recently published and last year's uh, government's construction playbook. But I'd like to see the principles of understanding value drivers being used throughout the whole investment life cycle, because that will start to unlock some innovation. And that will lead me on really to my second theme. What is that transformation of the sector that we should be seeking? Our industry has been characterised, sometimes fairly, sometimes not, as being fragmented, unprofitable and unsustainable. It is not the most diverse sector of our economy, nor is it the most productive. And there are many well-rehearsed uh, explanations of why, but I don't intend to unpick those. What I want to talk about is point to a vision of what a transformed sector could be. As an industry, we're normally extremely good at describing what we are doing. We describe the activity, the process, the sequence, and so on. What less good at doing is explaining why, what benefits are delivered through the approach that we take. What we are delivering, what is enabled by it, rather than the process that we're following. So if we consider, for example, a new school, rather than describe the structure, the finishes, the m and &E services, we should talk more about how it unlocks better educational outcomes, supporting communities, creating a better learning environment. These are the real outcomes we should be seeking from the investment we're making. So we need to make those value-based decisions part of our, our, our process. And we want to talk more, not just about the what, but the how. If we are to design and assemble this school using advanced digital and manufacturing techniques, we can also talk about sustainable materials that reduce carbon, more efficient processes that reduce the amount of waste we generate. We can create skilled long-term jobs in factories, meaning that projects in London and the South East can be serviced by a skilled and stable workforce in manufacturing heartlands in Teesside, East Midlands and South Wales. Leveling up isn't just about where we build, but how we build. So new technologies, digital tools, will help shift the image of the industry from dirty, cold, wet sites to high tech, more inclusive and attractive careers. The workforce in our sector should better represent the society it serves. This isn't about trying to convince people that unattractive jobs are actually really quite attractive. It's about creating attractive jobs and career paths for the next genera generation coming into our sector. 
I'm not sure construction will ever be the first career choice for everyone, but it doesn't have to language quite so far behind other parts of the, our economy than it, than it currently does. So let's stop describing what we do, but also promote what can be achieved from it being done. We need to innovate and have that innovation enabled. So what do I mean by that? So the Hub is running a funded R&D programme as part of the construction sector deal. And during my time in government, I only got into trouble once. And that's when I followed a, a business minister onto a platform where he had just been eulogising about the UK's world-class R&D capability. And I followed him onto the stage and said I disagreed. I said I thought we had fantastic research, but we're really quite poor at the development side, turning those ideas, turning those what's into how's that can make a difference. And I believe that there are uh, three levels of innovation that we need to transform our sector. They're all valid, but each having a different impact and different approach. And whenever I hear or see some new innovation or someone comes to tell me about an idea, I always mentally characterise it into one of these three levels. So level one is really doing the same thing, but just doing it properly. We make so many mistakes and repeat them over and over again. So a number of innovations help us to cut out those mistakes. Level two is doing the same thing, but doing it better. This is about improving the process or product to deliver that output much better. But the real prize to me is a level three, which is doing a better thing. This is a completely different set of outputs that deliver a far better outcome. Do the same thing properly, do the same thing better, do a better thing. And quite often how we think about value, how we are assessing inputs and outputs rather than outcomes is keeping us in that level one or level two. And I'd like to see us move into level three where we can unleash the creative, brilliant people who work in our industry to deliver those better outcomes. And I firmly believe that value-based decisions uh, will unlock those sort of opportunities. But if we insist on buying cheap, reinforcing the mistakes of it past years, we will compete on price, not value. And the best we can hope for is a marginal improvement, not a transformation. So the Hubs programme aims to help. And as I said, we're a market enabler, not a market player. Like traditional R&D programmes, we are investing in developing these new tools, products, solutions uh, that support the ambition of the construction sector deal. But we're going further. Just having a new technical solution alone will not deliver transformation. We need clients who want to buy these solutions. And we are greatly helped in the public sector, for example, by the uh, currently the hugely supportive policy environment, the construction playbook, the TIP roadmap. These support and indeed encourage value-based decisions. Value-based decisions considering the whole life performance that drive these better outcomes. So our programme has worked with government and policy makers to help shape this environment. And we aim to help clients answer the question, if this is the policy ambition, how do I implement it? How do I engage with the market? How do I deliver these ambitions? The what's there, the how is the hard part. So if there's a suite of technical solutions and there's clients who want to buy them, then the final piece of the jigsaw is to ensure that there's an industry that has built the right capability and capacity to respond. Transformation will really only happen when those three elements come together. A technical solution that meets the ambition, a client willing to buy it, and a market able to deliver it. So what would a transformed sector look like? Well, it will be more productive. Digital tools and manufacturing processes can unlock this. It will be more sustainable. We would use less carbon and less energy, create less waste, and the assets we create will support our path to net zero. I've seen research that says for every material delivery to our construction sites, it is moved on average four times before it's put into place. And separate research that says for every house we build in England, we send five tonnes of waste to landfill. Now, if you bang those two bits of research together, that says for every house we build in England, we deliver five tonnes of waste to site, we move it around four times and then drive it to landfill. That doesn't strike me as either productive or sustainable. So we must move on both productivity and the sustainability. And we also need to be 
more attractive as an industry to join, with better careers, better working conditions, being more diverse and inclusive. And there is evidence of a different mindset of young people who are entering today's workforce. Many in my generation, uh, when they graduated, when they started their careers, picked a company to join and then moved around with the work. Whereas many people joining today, the workforce, are picking a location and then moving organisations, moving companies to stay in that location. We need to factor this social shift into our approach if we are to attract the very best talent into our industry. And of course, it will be more profitable. Technology and innovation will improve productivity, will improve pr predictability, and value-based decisions will allow us to focus on delivering better outcomes, not just cheaper inputs. We're not trying to squeeze margins on tactical inputs, we're trying to deliver broader strategic outcomes. So if we can better articulate value and make better value-based decisions, and we have a vision of what a transformed sector might look like, it leads to my final point. What could this mean for the professionals working in our sector? And how might JCT both support and indeed enable this transformation? Now, I could take a very lazy approach to this question and say, it depends, or it's up to you. But I think there are a few givens that should be considered. Behaviours will need to change. The old confrontational adversarial approach, approaches do not support or create the right conditions for our transformation and new skills and competencies will be required in both in the enduring roles, such as commercial and contractual management, as well as the new roles, such as the manufacturing and digital and logistics, we're increasingly seeing coming as a key part of the delivery in our sector. Our processes, our contracts need to evolve to enable this transformation. Yeah, for example, I could ask the question, how will the contracts incentivise outcomes at not just a project level, but at an asset or a network or a system level? How do we get the outcomes that we seek from our investment into our contracts so we are incentivising and measuring and delivering against them? And I think there's an opportunity for JCT to be part of this vanguard, embracing digital as they're already doing, uh, embracing the opportunities of a transformed sector and a supportive environment and a demand from society and a need to accelerate a path to net zero. I hope and believe they will rise to this challenge. Now, I'm not sure anyone has really mapped out yet the shape and all of the steps that we'll need to take to get to this destination. We might agree on what the end state is, but really, there is still a debate to be had on the, route, the best route that we should take to get there. Do we want the first 10% to get there as soon as possible, but risk leaving a large rump of our sector behind and disenfranchised? Or do we want a more coordinated programme that brings more people with us on the journey, accepting that the pace may change slightly for that? And if I can, I'd like to take you back to the advice I received when I first went into Whitehall. Working out what to do is the easy part. Working out how to get it done is the real skill. And we ne will need to ensure that we put as much effort into the how as is being put in at the moment into the what. And if we don't, then my assertion that cost will never die, but value will become king may never be realised. Value is the key to unlocking the transformation of our sector. How we use it and how fast we can go requires all of you to play your part. I want to see a sector that is attractive, sustainable, productive and profitable. A sector that better reflects the society it deserves. Let's make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith. That, that was pretty inspiring. Um, we've got some questions already um, that have come in and if people would like to pose their questions. Um, I'd like to start with this one, Keith, because I think it's quite germane to what you were saying in one of your, one of your later points. Um, how would you suggest legal frameworks relating to contract and dispute management options can be adopted to help deliver value through the entire construction supply chain and improve whole life performance? 
I think that's one of the one of the areas that we we've been looking at very closely with the development of the value toolkit. So when I said we had um, around 600 individuals working with us on that, these are people who are covering you know, the commercial, the contractual, the delivery, the design aspects of it. And I think one of the areas about um, one of the challenges in the past is we've seen a disconnect as we've gone through the investment life cycle. The business case may ask for one thing. By the time that gets approved and it moves into procurement, the drivers appear to change. When we go into contract, there's a different set of drivers. When we go past construction into operation, there's a whole new set of metrics and measures. And we seem to be value destroying and leaking at each stage of the process. So we are, with the value toolkit, we don't have all the answers yet. I think we have most of the questions. So when we've, uh, we launched it as a pilot in the, uh, in the summer, uh, and we, we wanted to get around about 20 organisations to pilot the value toolkit, to test it out, to test out some of these questions around, you know, how do we actually make sure all parts of the investment life cycle, all things around our contracts, the way we approach design, the way we approach procurement, the way we approach delivery or operation, uh, are able to support these value drivers and these value outcomes. So we want to try and get 20 people. We ended up with 140. Uh, we wanted to try and test it on about £100 million worth of projects. It's many billions that we're testing on at the moment. And that pilot phase is coming to an end around about Christmas, and then we'll start to be able to answer some of those questions. So I think it's a really good question that I haven't quite got the answer to yet, but that's part of our six-month pilot programme, is to try and answer these questions. We want to produce something that is benefit to clients, that helps them make better decisions, is benefit, uh, benefits those that advise them, to help them make those better decisions. There's a real market in there for the advisory community. Um, and of course then supports our consultants and contractors to be able to deliver those outcomes that support those societal outcomes that we need. I don't want you to ask, ask you to name names, but could you characterise the types of um, organisations, bodies that are, are doing these, these test projects for you? Uh, it is, you will be, you would be household names. Right. So a lot of the very large consultants and the very large contractors, you know, the majority of them in those cases, probably I would guess at least half of the top 20 consultants, at least half of the top 20 contractors, but also a number of specialist firms mm -hmm. who are focusing on advice in particular areas um, or, you know, or, or have very niche businesses. So we've got small and large uh, consultants and contractors household names and new to market organisations, but there's 141 organisations piloting uh, the value toolkit at this current phase. So it's the supply side that, that's yeah, test but driving? It is, it is supply side, but then we're also working with a number of the government departments and private sector clients as well. So it has to be something, you know, it's, a, it's what an example of a, a technical solution that a client wants to buy and the market is able to deliver. So you so could do a sort of matchmaking service in a sense. It is, but what we're finding at the moment is clients are asking for it from their existing supply chain. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, those, those suppliers, those consultants, those advisors are, are wanting to go up that learning curve so they can use the value toolkit because their clients are asking for it. They've seen it being mentioned uh, in government policy documents like the construction playbook, like the TIP roadmap. So they're seeing a direction of travel that value-based decision-making is increasingly central to the policy. So they want to be in a position to be able to respond and take advantage of those opportunities. Um, thank you for that. Um, th there's an, another question here, which I think you've just answered, actually. Are there examples of value-based methodology or the value toolkit being used, or is it just theory at present? Man manifestly, it's not just theory. No, it's not just theory, but I mean, before we, before we launch it formally, release it into the wild, if you like, uh, we are going through this pilot phase. And this, this is the multi-billions uh, pounds worth of projects, programs, public and private sector, uh, with 140 supplier organisations doing. So it has been used on real projects and programmes. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, amongst those 140, some of it is being used, you could argue, theoretically, it's back-validating decisions that have already been taken. But on a, most of the work, it is forward-pointing. How do we actually make those decisions moving forward? So we're seeing quite a lot of uh, appetite for that because people are beginning to understand how it can support uh, and help them navigate what is this increasingly complex and constantly evolving policy environment. So 
I don't want to put you on the spot, but what is the date for the release into the wild of this system? Uh, it, will be, it will be around about the turn of the financial year. So around about April uh, next year is, is our target at the moment. Right, and there'll be a whole cam publicity campaign yeah, around that. A whole campaign that. around that in the same way there was um, a rather successful campaign to ask people if they wanted to pilot it. Yes. Uh, that was too successful, if you, are, uh, you know, but uh, yeah, but it's the same sort of principle there. And again, this is one of the areas where we are not, that Construction Innovation Hub is not going to be out there um, doing the value toolkit as a supplier. Our job is to, is to create something that is a benefit to the clients, that industry is able to build the capability to deliver itself. We're, we're, we're an enabler, not a player in that space. I'll certainly look at, I'm looking at your great website, I'll certainly be diarising to check that out. Um, I, this one starts with a compliment. It's uh, from Richard Saxon, actually, my, right. my uh, predecessor as chair. Excellent talk, Keith. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> How can the private sector access the value toolkit and start to use it? I mean, this is one thing I was going to, I, w I was dying to ask you because being a little bit cynical, when you look at the, the commercial sector, it's, it's pounds per square foot, whatever, certainly there are office buildings mm. that, that I'm involved with the contracts for. Um, how can you, get the private sector into going for value-based um, decisions rather than, rather than price-based decisions? Well, th they already are. And a lot of that's being driven by their investors. So you know, th their, their investors who are looking at the ESGs uh, of those organisations, and we're seeing a shift. Some of them are moving much quicker than others. Some of them aren't moving very much at all. But the, the value profile shape that I put up uh, uh, on the slide, you'd expect that to be different between a hard-nosed commercial organisation and perhaps a more uh, ethical uh, public sector organisation, shall we say. But actually, when we've done value profiles with some of the more forward-thinking private sector developers, those commercial developers, we're not seeing a huge difference because their investors, their investors and their access to ethical and green finance is changing some of the dynamic of how they make decisions. So there are a number that are focused on initial capital cost, pounds per square foot, there are others who are looking at how they can demonstrate they're meeting those social responsibility goals. They are supporting a path to net zero. Many of them have signed up you know, to climate emergency pledges. The finance they want to access, the higher quality, better finance, is asking the questions that it wasn't asking five or ten years ago. But how many, I mean, in my experience certainly, how many of those decisions are actually driven by the end user rather than the developer or... Um it varies. It does vary. I mean, some 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 of the developers have a much uh, longer investment period that they are considering as part of their decision. Some of them are just looking for a quick turn. Mm -hmm. But actually, one of the you know we, we've seen some examples of buildings uh, going up in London at the moment where we've been doing that combination of value-based decision making, or the client has we you know we've been helping with them, and they're using more manufactured approaches. So actually, you've got an, a, a, some of them can go up quicker. Is perhaps more easily reconfigurable, you know, rather than has to be demolished and, and rebuilt if it's being repurposed. So we can repurpose buildings uh, better in a way that, that perhaps de-risks some of those investments. So the ability to not just turn it, but actually see it as a longer term asset. Uh, but as you rightly say, there's just a wide variety of approaches that different clients, different developers are taking. And we're working, the ones we're working with generally are the ones that are forward thinking. Uh, you know, the, if it's just how cheap can I buy it and how much risk can I transfer to the supply chain, you don't need a value toolkit for that. Just do what you did for the last 40 years. Yes, yes. Yeah. And did, is this starting before COVID? Because obviously the, um, the topic of, as people have many careers in their life that are a single building may have many purposes. How far has that been driven with by what's happening in the last two years, or has that already started? It already started. You might argue it's accelerating a little bit now. Uh, so I think there, there's probably a number of stranded assets or assets that were temporarily stranded, that we're, and we're seeing repurposing of high streets and so on. So the ability to, to flex buildings and change their purpose uh, and still deliver all those quality aspects perhaps is a more important part of the of the investment decision that people will take in the future. It did start pre-COVID, it's probably a little bit more prevalent mm. post-COVID. Um, this, is, this is a difficult one. Thank you, uh, thank you, Keith. How does the toolkit manage subjective quality judgments um, 
to works to heritage assets, etc., where you don't start with a green sheet of paper. Yeah, I think there there are certain areas. I don't think we're testing it on any heritage projects at the moment, but we have we have quite a large technical team who are working on its development. But I think it would, it may be that you end up with a different value profile. You're starting to value different things. So we talked about the four capitals model. Within those four capitals, we have a number of metrics, a number of sort of measures and drivers that sit within those. But each of those has a series of metrics and measures that sit beneath that. And we've set it up in a way that allows the clients and the specifics of that project to choose which metrics are important to them. So we're seeing some, uh, some clients who are uh, very keen on, on biodiversity. Some are very keen on design quality. Some of them are very keen on uh, social value. And how you combine them allows you to make perhaps a more quantitative than, and maybe less qualitative discussion. But there's, there is within the, the tool itself quite a lot of detail that sits below that very simple shape that I put up on the slide. Uh, and I'd encourage, in fact, there's a lot of literature you can download from our, thank you very much, very nice website uh, that will give you a bit more information. I don't think I could answer specifically that heritage question, but I know in the detail there'll be something that will so address that it. So though people will consider that the application of that yeah. to heritage buildings. Um, government strategy document Construction 25 sets targets for 33% lower costs and 50% faster delivery by 2025. Is that still achievable? I think the still there has a, a, a sort of wealth of implication as in pandemic, supply chain problems, construction inflation, etc. Well, that's being measured at the moment. So we're, we're, we're seeing uh, there's, there's 33s and 50s abound in, in that sort of, uh, in that construction 25, which was, I think, came out in uh, the middle of 2013. It was around about that, so it's about, it gave us 12 years at the time. Uh, we are seeing that happening in certain areas. Um, uh, I think we're there on one or two areas already. So we've seen a couple of projects which are, you know, delivering nine for the price of five and in half the time and with half the carbon. But that's not endemic everywhere at the moment. And part of the, you know, part of the challenge uh, we're seeing is uh, you know, very similar projects that you would think could be delivered in a very similar way. We're seeing value drivers um, being incredibly different, different commercial strategies, different delivery models being suggested, which sometimes mitigate against that happening. So if, do I think that we will hit all of those targets on every construction project by 2025? I don't. Do I think there'll be some projects where it is happening? I do. And I think we've already got evidence of uh, at scale, uh, at small scale, that happening. The challenge and the opportunity is to try and get that diffusion and that deployment uh, faster and wider, quicker. But one of the areas that um, government is being very good at uh, is trying to drive a more coordinated and consistent approach across its portfolio. So suppliers who work building uh, schools or prisons or hospitals aren't going to have to adopt three minimum uh, different approaches. There's a much more harmonised approach to how clients will set out their requirements, deliver their specifications, engage with the market. So uh, you know, industry is going to be in a better place to develop those solutions that can beat a much, more, uh, much wider, much more sustainable, much more long-term market. We'll be there but not on every project. I suppose it would be a bit mean to ask you to instantly assess what the impact of the last two years has been, but we'll, uh, if somebody is studying that now, presumably to... Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, the impact, um, the impact, I think, we had, there was a conversation that was happening uh, this morning at, at, um, in, uh, on a panel in Digital Construction Week where uh, panellists were asked to assess, uh, you know, what they thought the impact of Brexit and COVID had been. You know, and, and whilst, you know, in both cases, you could argue there's been some really quite serious negative uh, immediate impacts. The question was more framed around what's the long term impact going to be when those particular you know, transient phases have passed. And I think there was a general view that um, it's perhaps been more of an accelerator of change or created more drivers for that transformation. We aren't able to rely on a readily available pool of European labour to service our projects. So therefore, we need to think about how can we be more productive, uh, you know, and, and think about manufacturing heartlands rather than site-based delivery. And if we'd still had access to that cheap, available pool of labour, would the driver, you know, for change, would the, the burning platform be there in quite the way it is at the moment? 
know, if we, the two largest things we transport by volume in the construction sector are waste and air. You know, if we've got a shortage of, uh, of HGV drivers and most of our vehicles are carrying at least 50% waste and air at any one moment in time, then you actually think, well, if we could be more efficient and have manufactured solutions in containers that are delivered to site, we're transporting less waste, less air, therefore we need less drivers, therefore the effect of not having European drivers to drive our plants and our HGVs around will not be so serious. So some of these you know, bad events um, have, can serve to accelerate or provide greater impetus for a change and a transformation. So you combine that with a supportive policy environment, a much more collaborative spirit amongst the industry and the market itself. You, know, you could argue that uh, you know, the, uh, my confidence that we'll reach those targets today is probably greater than it was two years ago. Yes, it puts me in mind of one, one, of, one of my clients who, um, I, it, it was clean excavated soil, but it was taken straight from the site um, to be put straight into a new, um, a new leisure facility, a new, herit a, a new nature park, and that's very efficient. It just went a few miles away and put it, put, put it in the ground to become countryside park. I mean, that, that would, if everybody could do that. Yeah, I mean, there, there's lots of examples, but you know, if you, we only make decisions based on a individual project, and we're not thinking about that broader ecosystem and that broader system, then, then we'll, we'll miss some of those opportunities. Um, this is this is a leading question, possibly an invitation, though I don't know who's extending it to you, Keith. Um, so this is from Nick D. I can't work out who that is. Given the importance and the difficulty in establishing the how, can Keith help JCT explore how their products could help could help with the how? Um, I'm quite happy to extend that invitation to you, <laughs> to yeah, you very myself, happy to. but uh, yeah, perhaps we could have a, a further well, discussion. Uh, yeah, about, I'm, about I'm that. very welcome to that. Cause, I mean, uh, you know the. There are many times when government um, has stopped when it's published a document. Mm. And I remember the very first national infrastructure plan, the, the, the first proper full one, was published in 2011. And I was, I was helping to write uh, elements of that. But the lead author, mm. the day it went out, he went, oh, thank goodness for that. That's job finished. And I went, no, no, mm. that's job started. Mm. You know, so they, having published a document of what we're going to do, people are asking, clients and the market are asking, well, that's the what, how do I do it? How do I, what do I need to do to take advantage mm -hmm. or to, uh, you know, for the opportunities here to be realised? The how is really important. The what is easy, the how's the... I'd the certainly be very interested in discussing how you, how you get the private sector involved because, I mean, it's the natural nature of these things that, um, that JCT contracts are more often used in the commercial sector. That's so, fine. I mean, we, so. work, we, 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 we work with pu public and private sector clients alike. And there's, there's one more question because it isn't really a question. I think it's a comment. Um, so um, Mark Milburn at Locat Ed, it says, schools construction is premised on the local education needs and certainly the free school site considerations include social and local development benefits. The DfE are now quite advanced in rolling out MMC sustainability and net zero carbon design materials construction and use. So that's uh, absolutely right. That's and we've been working with the Department for Education on their Gen Zero schools. In fact, I, I funded part of that work for DfE to do that with their supply chain, which was looking at uh, sustainable manufactured solutions to deliver schools of the future. Now, we need to build hundreds of schools. Um, we need to exploit the opportunities to create those better learning environments. Uh, but we can support more productive delivery, more sustainable delivery through that. And DfE are, you know, are a, a really good client at looking at their portfolio and working out how they can lever their benefits. One of the reasons we've been working closely with them is there are differences but similarities between schools and hospitals. There are certain common elements. Uh, and if you're a supplier manufacturing, let's say, wall panels, you know, would it be a better investment opportunity for you if you could develop products that could be used on multiple different projects and multiple different building types? So DfE, uh, uh, absolutely agree. Really, really first class client in terms of looking at their technical solution. You know, and you know, if they start combining that with some of the principles on you know, how they might address their commercial aspects, their procurement aspects, align with the tip and with the, uh, with the construction playbook, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, it's great to hear that be used in practice. I'm afraid that was our final question, that's all we've got time for. 
Uh, so it just remains to me, to me to say thank you very much to Keith and um, I think further conversations to be had with the JCT and we'll keep you, keep you updated as to how that develops. Um, thank you also very much audience out there for, for attending um, and it's been a very interesting talk and you'll in due course find um, details of the talk on the JCT website. Thank you.